The United States and Israel have agreed on a record new package of U.S. military aid. The deal, worth at least $38 billion, represents the biggest pledge of U.S. military assistance ever made to a foreign party. While Israel's supporters argue the aid should be more than the agreed sum, critics view this as a green light to Israel's repression of the Palestinian people and a continuation of its belligerent policies in the region. In this edition of the debate, we ask what this deal means for U.S.-Israel ties and Israel's policies vis-a-vis -vis Palestine. The United States and Israel have agreed on a record package of at least $38 billion in U.S. military aid. It's a 10-year pact expected to be signed within days. The deal will represent the biggest pledge of U.S. military assistance ever made to any foreign party. Tel Aviv states that it needs the aid to protect itself against foreign aggression. But Israel's weapons and equipment have many times been used against other countries in the region, including Palestinians, particularly those in the besieged Gaza Strip. Israel has also staged attacks on Lebanon and has been occupying the Golan Heights from Syria since 1967. The Palestinian people, they're already completely defenseless. So if they have a new uh, series of weapons, a new generation of weapons technology, it will make no difference whatsoever. That is not the threat uh, to Israel. There's no military threat to Israel. The, the new package calls for at least $3.8 billion a year in aid, up from $3.1 billion under the current pact, which expires in 2018. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has originally sought $4.5 billion a year. Reports say the negotiators had all but completed the new package several weeks ago. But an announcement was quietly put on hold as objections were raised by a key pro-Israel lawmaker, Republican U.S. Senator Lindsey Graham, who had called for a more generous and less restrictive aid package. Israel controls the American Congress. That's still, nothing has changed. And this is, as I said, the consolation prize that makes uh, uh, Israel uh, feel better about the Iran deal. Qualitative military. Israel has been the largest recipient of U.S. foreign assistance since World War II. According to Congress, America's military assistance to Israel has amounted to over $124 billion since it began in 1962. U.S. annual aid to Israel has held steady despite cuts to a wide range of domestic programs, even during the financial crisis and meltdown which began in 2007. That's largely because the U.S. government is pressured by pro-Israeli groups to steer U.S. foreign policy in favor of Tel Aviv. This is an environmental issue. Well, let me start off by introducing our guest. Joining us uh, from London is journalist and political commentator Hafsakara Mustafa. And joining us uh, from New York is also journalist and political commentator Maxine Dover. Uh, ladies, many thanks for joining us here in this edition of the debate. Ms. Kara uh, Mustafa, I'll start off with you if I may. Now, this memorandum of understanding does, doesn't come as a surprise at all. But how does it actually spell out on the ground? There are those who say that the aid is technically just one percent of Israel's GDP, so it's not really going to impact things in a large way. Uh, I happen to agree actually with that point because this is essentially a PR stunt. What you'll look at, if you look at the sums broken down per year, it's not that much of a difference to what the US gives Israel at the moment. But what this is doing is actually giving a PR photo op for, ben sorry, for Netanyahu and also for Obama who is actually preparing his post-presidency career. Remember American presidents, especially when they're quite young, they leave office and they need to have a career that comes after uh, the presidency and so what Obama is doing is actually nurturing the potential uh, speaking fees he'll be enjoying by the very powerful pro-Israeli organization organizations that will pay him hefty sums and by doing this by sort of pledging more support for Israel he's already guaranteeing and ensuring that his post-presidency is actually 
uh, ensured. For Netanyahu, this is a way of saying uh, to his electorate and also to the pro-American Israelis that, look, he's managed to secure even more money and milk more money out of the American taxpayer. We know that that's going to be used in arms and it, we know that it's going to be used to slaughter more Palestinians, which is quite a vote winner for many of the racist American electorate. So essentially, this is more, if anything, this really is just a PR stunt. Well, Mr. Overe, I'd like to get your opinion on this, if I may, and I'd like to add that pro-Israeli groups like AIPAC have stressed that this U.S. aid represents the, quote, immutability of the U.S.-Israel alliance. Well, a lot of the things that my colleague in London has said have some merit. The uh, amount of money in the forward-going MOU is not significantly different, although it is uh, several hundred million a year in the, in the uh, course of things of countries. That is not a significant differential, although a lot of jobs and a lot of uh, uh, industry will depend on those hundreds of millions of dollars, specifically in America where the majority of the money, a very significant majority of the money, is by law and by obligation to be spent. The uh, current ratio of spending in Israel versus spending in America is about uh, one out of four. That, according to my understanding of this current MOU, is in fact going to be lessened so that there will be more spending in America. That is a big uh, positive for American workers and for American industry. The uh, use of the, the statement of PR is one that, that um, yes, of course, there's a public uh, aspect of any, any agreement that is publicly known. And uh, this is certainly something that bodes positive for the Israeli uh, military defense effort. And I stress defense effort because this is a security uh, and defense package. It is not an offensive package. And the, the uh, wars that are noted in, in my English colleagues' uh, noting are wars of defense. And I know that there is a significant majority in Israel, and I would guess in the Palestinian Authority as well, and in Gaza, that would prefer that these wars not occur in future. Okay, let that me throw this to Ms. Akara Mustafa. Ms. Akara Mustafa, Israel should get this package because A, it creates American jobs as Israel buys defensive weapons to fight its defensive war against the population of Gaza. I, I have to say, I found that, that rather is not funny what I said. statement. Uh, well, well, in substance, uh, uh, what my co-panelist said was that the money is going to benefit American workers. So in essence, what the American administration and what the U.S. Congress have approved is to give money to a foreign state, which hopefully will then somehow benefit American workers. So rather than directly investing that money to create law, jobs locally... It is, is, rather than just directly creating and investing money in the U.S., it's handing over money to a foreign state, which when eventually might spend some of that money, a percentage of that money, on U.S. arms. We know that the actual Israelis have violated the terms of the agreement in the past and have actually invested the money from aid exclusively in Israeli firms. So by law or not by law, I'm not sure what will happen to Israel if it doesn't, because already the Congress is already fully appreciative of whatever Israel does, doesn't challenge in any way, shape or form any Israeli administration and actually affords Israeli leaders 26 uh, standing ovations. So I think Benjamin Netanyahu can actually throw the money down the drain and US congressmen who slavishly support whatever Israel does will not exactly do anything. Uh, one point about the uh, use of the word defensive, I think again that is a rather amusing term given that it is Israel that is illegal legally occupying foreign land and it's not being 
occupied by any foreign land. So if anything, the defensive uh, aspect of this sort of military relationship has to come from the Palestinians who are illegally occupied, who are on a regular basis being bombed. It should come from the Lebanese who were occupied for 22 years uh, in the south and who are regularly bombed. It should come from the Syrians who continue to see the Golan Heights illegally occupied. The only people who should be doing defensive work should be those who are victims of Israeli aggression and not the other way around. Go ahead, Ms. Jovera. see you have a response. Well, I think this is a, indeed an amusing response. If there is a statement uh, that's been historically said by many Israelis, uh, which relates to the fact that if, if Israel were to put down its arms to not have defense, Israel would find itself in the sea. If those arms are, in fact, for defense, as they are, then Israel will remain in its stable position with its borders. The, the, those lands that are under discussion, under occupation, under dispute, should be discussed. And yes, there should be, in my eye, a two-state solution that will give self-government to each people in that regional area, in that geopolitical messy area. The question remains is what will those who would uh, have that second state consider the place of Israel. According to the Hamas, uh, uh, the Hamas Constitution, uh, and Charter rather, it, it is uh, a condition that Israel not exist. How then can Israel not defend itself and not have the first priority and the first level of defense to have a qualitative edge as the MOU states? Right, Mr. Ovir, let me just jump in there. The uh, when you spoke of the so-called two-state solution, um, a CIA report from 1960 outlined that if Israel were able to achieve military hegemony in the region, it would lose interest in pursuing peace with the Palestinians and its neighbors through meaningful and justified concessions. What would you say to that? I would say let's sit down, let's have the Israelis and the Palestinians sit together as uh, the Israeli government under most, and every prime minister rather, from Sharon to Barak to Omar to Netanyahu has requested, has begged, has asked for face-to-face -face negotiations. It's, it's Abbas who has refused to sit with Netanyahu oh, or have his government representatives sit with Israeli government representatives. Put the challenge no, th this forward. Is just, 95, 96 percent of, of the requests were made without any negotiation. It was the last bits and pieces, and Arafat walked out. Arafat walked out. And I, and why did he did not continue the negotiation? No. Let me just put this question to you, Mr. Does the U.S. support, just the U.S. military support, or any other support for Israel provided with the incentives to sit down on the negotiating table? Why should it? Uh, Israel now benefits from the support of the most powerful, military powerful nation in the world. As we see, the Congress is completely sold to, you, to Israeli interests. Actually, U.S. congressmen are more in favor, uh, are more interested in the welfare of Israel than they are of the American people. So they have the unconditional support of that Israel, of the U.S. And therefore, the, no, excuse totally me, I did not interrupt you, incorrect. despite all the stupid things you were saying thing, or, and all the lies you were spewing, so please don't interrupt. That's enough. Because the U.S. Congress is completely slavish to Israeli interests, and therefore Israel has absolutely no interest in actually engaging in peace talks because it has the support of the international worldwide bully. Now, when we're hearing that it's Israel who supported and who offered peace, we know that constantly they keep encouraging the building of illegal settlements, 
even despite what the American administration has advised against. Just recently, they've ordered the building of extra settlements. So what they're saying is they're actually gnawing into Palestinian land while claiming that they're happy to engage in peace talks. What kind of two-state is possible when actually Israel continues to expand? And there is just one question I'd like to hear uh, Ms. Dover actually answer when she speaks of Israeli borders and the potential for countries to come together and agree to them. What are Israel's borders? It's a simple question. Please state what are Israel's borders today and let's see how we can take this discussion further. Go ahead, Ms. Dover. The borders that were internationally established until mm -hmm. 1967 are borders that are uh, considered to be starting points. Israel was so successful that doesn't include the Golan in Heights, a war for one thing. in 1960. Pardon? It doesn't include the I, Golan I Heights for starters comment. then. I said it wouldn't include the Golan Heights for the, starters then. No, I would, I would say that no country in the history of military actions has all of a sudden given back everything that it has achieved. Can uh, okay. the Golan Heights be, can the Golan Heights be used as perhaps a neutral area, perhaps an area that is demilitarized in the, in the, uh, force, in the future d uh, development? That's uh, answers that neither one of us has. Not, not uh, having knowledge of what the specifics are, it would be foolish to make a statement. I won't make that kind of a statement. I don't have the knowledge. What I do know is that I have been in Ramallah, and I have been in Jerusalem, and I have spoken to people on both sides of the question, and I can gather the interests of those who would see a positive development. Look at what's going on in Rawabi, which is a wonderfully modern development of 30,000 homes 15 miles from Ramallah. That's what could be the future of the Palestinian Authority. Why shouldn't all of us aim for that kind of a future? Well, Ms. Dover, I think the question here like is, is that does Israel East? have that incentive to sit down and make the concessions that are required from it to be made? I believe it does. I believe it does. And, I, and the, the word defense what are the incentives? Often entails, what are the incentives? The incentives are quiet, normal living for all of the citizens of the region, not only the Israelis, not only the Palestinians, not only the Gazans, all of the citizens of the region. We certainly don't want to see any kind of a conflagration similar to what's going on in, in Syria continue to grow, and a strong, settled segment of the region would encourage the, the normalization in Syria. And when, when my colleague in London speaks about the Congress being in favor of the Israeli position, let me remind you that the favor is a mutual situation. America benefits from this relationship, as does Israel. And as do the well, other countries in the Middle East who are looking for stability. For example, military exercises that are run as a co-run between the United States and its allies in the Middle East, whether it's okay, Israel or whether it's Egypt or whether it's Ms. Greece Hafsa or Mustafa, Turkey. You don't seem convinced. Go ahead. Well, of course, I'm not convinced. First of all, I, I have to say, I find the use of the we from what is seemingly an American commentator rather interesting. So the line really is blurred, blurred between what is an American and what is an Israeli, especially in the media, I note. But on a point of the Congress, I remember the leader of the, of the House actually humiliating his president, who was elected by a majority of the Americans, in favor of Benjamin Netanyahu not so long ago. So again, the idea that the Congress isn't completely 
sold to Israel is, is, is a fallacy. We know that. I think international observers and anyone who is remotely interested in the news can actually see that the Congress is far more interested in the interests of Israel because, of course, every congressman is on the payroll of APAC and all these other organizations. And therefore, they're more interested in seeing Israel get lots and lots of money than actually even Americans getting health care for free. So that's the farcical situation. When we talk about the incentives for the Israelis to see peace, well, we'd love to see that. But as I recall, Israelis were sitting on couches eating popcorn while their military was bombing and blasting and flattening Gaza and everything and when we hear that some cities could be uh, you know harmonious and be living in peace well every time the Palestinians have actually built infrastructure they've built airports they've built hospitals the Israelis wait for them to finish it and then come and bomb the whole places. Now, what country, what other situation in the planet is actually under military siege? These are medieval conditions in which the Palestinians are currently li living. You know, Palestinian fishermen cannot go beyond five kilometers to fish, otherwise a military warship will actually blast them. This is the situation Palestinians live in. And again, maybe Ms. Dover is not knowledgeable enough about the Golan Heights, but I'd have to say that I am. The Golan Heights are Syrian, they're no one else's, and they have to be returned to Syria. All right, Ms. Dover, I do know that you have a response. However, we're short of time. I'll give you just one minute to answer this uh, as your closing remarks. When it comes to U.S. Israel ties, be it through military aid or any other uh, form of a PR stunt, as Ms. Hafsakar Mustafa put it, how do you see it affecting the geopolitical? Uh, arena within the Middle East because it's not just limited to Palestine now is it? Look, America and Israel have many, many shared interests. They have interest in the continuity and growth of Western civilization in the American <laughs> format, which is very close to the Israeli format. The, uh, the shared interests are expanded. Yeah. Uh, Egypt also is uh, included in the growth of America's uh, positioning in, in the Middle East. Turkey certainly is an ally, a NATO ally, and when the, uh, the interests of America are questioned, it's the interests of America that have to take precedent. And when those interests benefit from relationships with its allies, as the, as the ones I've named uh, in the Middle East, and certainly there are, there are several hundred others that would like to share interests with America throughout the world, then American congressmen reflect the interests of America. Okay, Ms. Hapsakara Mustafa, same question, you just have under a minute. The interests of anyone else is a fallacy. Well, all I can say is that if what the U.S. shares in common with Israel is its history and the way it was built. America was built on the bloodshed and on the genocide of the native indigenous population and it's very clear that what Israel is doing is looking to exterminate the indigenous population of the land of Palestine. Every other year we're having a mass scale massacre, we're having a people under siege, we're having people blown up, exterminated, whose land is confiscated and I think the plan is very much similar to what the Americans did back in the day to the, U to the native population and I think this is what makes the two states and the two administration have so much in common. All right, we're fresh out of time. That's journalist and political commentator Hafsa Kara Mustafa joining us from London and joining us from New York was journalist and political commentator Maxine Dover. Ladies, thank you very much indeed for participating in this edition of the debate. From me and the entire team here in Tehran, it's goodbye.